Hey friends, it's that time again. Kenny Jang here with the Church Tech Today podcast. And today we're sitting in downtown Boulder, Colorado, beautiful Boulder, um, here at the AI and the Church Hackathon sponsored by Glue. And I've gathered a uh, wealth of wisdom and expertise here at the table. Well, they. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to talk about AI, AIO, as I call it. Um, why don't we just get right down to it and introduce um, yourselves to our audiences and our friends here watching today. So, JP, why don't you go first? Yeah, I'm James Poulter. Everyone knows me as JP. I lead AI and innovation at House 337, formerly uh, Vixen Labs, the agency that we were running up until just last year. Okay. My name is Jason Malik. I work here at Glue with the AI team. And I'm Neil Smith. I'm the head of innovation at Dunham & Company. So um, let's just get to the first question that I've been getting because not many people know what a hackathon actually is. So would one of you gentlemen just share what goes on in a hackathon? What is this thing that we're doing? Jason, you're hosting. I'm hosting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a hackathon is an opportunity for technologists, strategists, uh, media people to come together to essentially take on problems, call it uh, societal problems. Here we're talking about the five dimensions of human flourishing. And so teams have been divided up uh, three to five, maybe mm -hmm. folks per team. There's 40 teams here that are competing to build new and innovative technology yeah. uh, revolved around artificial intelligence that solve uh, problems in any of those five dimensions of human flourishing. Right. And the teams arrived on Friday and yep. they're working around the clock until Sunday morning where the yep. judging is going to happen. And there's going to be prizes yep. and celebrations and things like that. So, a lot of pizza and deodorant. A lot of Red Bull, <laughs> yep. Taco Bell, late night runs, yep, yep. a lot of fun. Yep. Um, so one of the things that I love about these hackathons is that you just see a lot of imagination at work. Um, I had a very good conversation with Tim from Uversion, their R and D department, and what he he asked a great question is like, what is, gets you excited about technology and faith and religion right now? So mm. as you're roaming the tables and seeing all the projects and the collaboration happening, what what is inspiring you in terms mm. of the future of technology and Christianity, religion, faith? Anybody? Well, I think the thing that's interesting is that they're not just solving kind of faith-based problems. These are people problems. They're, they're things that real people face every day, right? Whether that's on the kind of back end of some of these applications they're building on, how much time does it take to transcribe audio or edit things down or you know, translate into another language? And AI is just completely transforming those experiences. But there's also then unlocking stuff for people at the other end, which is individual people, you and I, trying to disciple people or you know do evangelism or read the bible or you know hold just church community together in a way which is you know let's face it like it's difficult in a world of digital distraction and you know um people yeah you know, particularly post-pandemic being spread around the world in different ways they're solving real problems that will affect people's experience of what it means to come to know jesus and, and go on a journey of knowing him so that's what's exciting is that, that this technology is unlocking things that just were not possible mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was going to say five years ago, but even two years ago, yeah. 12 months ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing like the first fruits of what that could really mean for some of the, both the big players, like some of the big you know, faith tech ecosystem people, and also just individual developers that have come with an idea. Yes, and, like, yes. and, it, and a good idea can come from anywhere. And it, and it, it, sh it shows what I love it. Now, for the audience, maybe Jason or Nils, are, are there any specific ideas you've heard of or seen that these guys are working on? Just to give them some concrete ideas of what's going on at this hackathon. What type of problems, what type of solutions yeah. are you seeing? The, you know, there's, there's two that come to mind that, that really stood out to me. One is some language translation using AI. And, and I think practically, as we think about the Great Commission, what a great opportunity we have mm -hmm. today. And I think historically through media, we've had a unique opportunity, but now you combine that with language translation mm -hmm. and how AI is making that more efficient. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, that's really exciting. Another is, you know, I saw basically use of a large language model with input data that's allowing people to basically go through an apologetics journey of, you know, if somebody coming from another faith to, to learn about Christianity, it's got so much data in there to help answer their questions. And so it's it, what I'm seeing, I think that really excites me with that is just practical application. I think, I think historically when I've come to things like this, I see a lot of cool tech, but just because we can do it doesn't mean we should yeah. do it. And, and it's maybe yeah. an off, you know, it's not going to be used by that many people where what the things that I'm seeing built here are practically going to be used by tons of ministries and, and have so much application. And so that's mm. that progression is really exciting. Jason, what about you? 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer maybe the two questions you asked. The first was, why is this different? Why is yeah. this significant? And, you know, it's interesting. I, I think about what's going on in the news. I think we, many of us probably read the article about open AI being valued at, what was it, $150 billion Crazy. yesterday. Yes. Uh, you know, that that's amazing. But, but open AI is solving some interesting problems. What's happening here, there's probably not many folks here that are going to uh, be valued at $150 billion. Yep. But they're solving, to JP's point, some very real, very, yeah. very human issues. Uh, one of those that that I've seen, and we've just begun to see some of these solutions coming out, uh, revolves around mental health, identifying yeah. identifying what some of the uh, chronic issues are, acute issues, and figuring out how to connect people yeah, yeah. in real time uh, to help solve some yeah. of those mental health issues so it's really fun to see these things yeah. develop yeah. and the thing is with some of that stuff particularly you mentioned like with the large language model examples the ease of accessing that technology has now become so interesting because it's like yeah we've got people in there that are developers some yeah. of them have got yeah. a long development career some of them are literally stitching together with a bunch of consumer level tools mm -hmm. which again i feel like that's just that kind of low and no code solution thing has really come into the fore in the, the ai space like yeah. It, yeah we saw it in web apps we saw it in mobile but now with you know people being able to pull you know even code pulled together by chat gpt right you know some of these guys are building stuff where they're working with an ai model to build a new ai yes. tool yes. Yes. Just, you know there's some kind of weird digital inception thing going on but like it, it's, it's crazy funny. exciting yeah. that how much potential yeah. there is so yeah. we're in this little bit of a bubble though right the way there's innovators technologists people who are future forward thinkers and they're creating solutions that will actually work yeah what do you think it's going to take for the general pastor, church staff market to really adopt or embrace these things? Because they, in, as I'm going out to different audiences and groups mm -hmm. and uh, workshops and ministries, um, I, you know, I think you all see it too, that there is a general hesitancy and reluctance and sometimes just downright fear and objection to AI. Mm -hmm. What do you think the hurdles are going to be for mass level adoption of the or what does it take to get to the tipping point where most churches are going to be comfortable in embracing ai more yeah. and i, I think i think it's probably just ease of use I, I think when we even look at the adoption rate culturally with chat gpt being the fastest adopted technology in history i i think actually in culture we're we're not as resistant to this technology and and right, i don't yeah. sense it even with church leaders that there there's some concerns and i think that's healthy to have some concerns, uh, but but I think it's actually how to use it and understanding yeah. how to use it. And I think this is in some ways needing technology that is made for the purposes yeah. of ministry. Yeah. And so I think that that intentionality user and yeah. I think just good user interface goes a long way yeah. in how you build a product that ministry leaders can use effectively. I think we're seeing this trend at the moment, which is similar to what we saw about 10 years ago when people started bringing smartphones into the workplace. And we talked about like bring your own device. I think we're going to have bring your own AI, which mm. is that because many ministries, churches, organizations, enterprises are, are reluctant, and it's not just the church that's hesitant, right? Yeah. It's the same in corporate you know, spaces as well. But individual people we know are adopting this technology. We've just done this study, which is coming out this next couple of weeks, which is going to show that around about 35% of people in America are already regularly using, as in right. every week, using uh, some form of generative tool. Over half have at least tried it in the past month. Hmm. When that happens at a kind of individual congregant level, if there's going to be a trickle down effect where they're coming to their pastor or they're coming to their minister or organizing team and saying, "Hey, I'm using this. Why aren't you?" And that bring your own AI thing, I think, is go is going to actually begin to have that catalyst effect to yeah. make us get hmm. to the tipping point much quicker than maybe than we saw in social media, you know, as we got started yes. about ten years ago. So your question was, what's it going to take for this to kind of be democratized, to be accepted yeah, I, I'm within a, the church? I'm assuming you agree with me <clears throat> that there is a general reluctance and that as, as is, amazing yeah. as the teams here are going to produce amazing yeah, yeah, yeah. results, yeah. Yeah. the next question is adoption, right? we got to get yeah. them to the adoption. Yeah, I think to some extent, the how we've answered the question, you know, to this point is really addressing early adopters and maybe that next wave. I do think there's a group of people that are going to be highly resistant. And I think what it's going to take for the the kind of corpus of people of faith is a, probably a new level of, of governance, a new level of trust, yeah. Yeah. a new level of confidence in the models and that these models are actually representing information yeah. that, yeah. that, you know, they claim to represent. 
And that's going to take time. That's you know, it, we at, at Blue just launched uh, the Christian Align Large Language Model, and we're we're intentionally trying to build models that actually serve people with integrity, with confidence to give them confidence. And I think over time, as we develop regulatory, you know, kind of mm-hmm. governance issues. Hopefully we can earn trust yeah. and confidence. Yeah. And that came out, we had a working group here at the Hackathon a couple of days ago, um, thinking about what are some of the ethical issues that we need to kind of address, whether that's the engagement with youth or, you know, people with, you know, kind of protected, um, you know, classifications all the way through to, you know, CCTV in church, yes. and AI over the top of facial recognition. Like there's some really interesting issues yeah. to unpack. I was encouraged. We we said that there would be a working group that would come around ethics and, you know, begin to think about yeah. publishing that stuff. So, there's a movement behind this and, and to yeah kind of the point that neil's made earlier i can think back to what we went through with the web and what we went through with social media and it took a long time for the church to engage with it in a healthy way and not see it as some kind of evil thing we have to push back on we're 24 months since chat gpt came out at this point and there's like 40 different christian-based teams in there coming up with ai ideas and we're sat here having a podcast talking about ai ethics in the church like that acceleration is crazy yes. quick. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So actually, I'm really encouraged by that because the engagement that there is in this topic is is so much bigger than there was in previous um, go-rounds. I think we've also learned the lessons of the past. We've seen the, the downstream effects of social media. We've seen the negative stuff that can come, but also the massive opportunity. And so we approach it with open arms in this space as well. That There, there can be problems, but there's also huge chances for the gospel. So let's, there's a thread in there that I want to explore a little further because... Um, it seems like there are there's there's a clear group of early adopters say we are included in that yeah. way we see the opportunity the mm-hmm. upside right. of AI but I don't think any of us would agree with the, the statement of everyone should be all in yeah. mm-hmm. on every use no. of AI yeah, yeah. right yeah um, and right. the the ones that have concerns which is the majority right now um, I think would would feel more comforted to know or hear where are the boundaries that we feel that AI should not be used or where, where's the caution? What are the concerns? So I'm wondering if each of you can just maybe think of one area or concern that we feel like, oh, that's a little bit past the line where we should go or we should really think about this twice. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I think of two things uh, when I think about church ministry in particular. One is in sermon delivery. You know, I think I think AI can be a great tool to help you prepare your sermon. I don't think AI should write your sermon. Whoa, 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 really? Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Let's, I, I'm, gonna, I wanna, I'm, okay. I'm almost like I'm getting rear ready yeah. to gear up. I, I, I mean, I think I think practically there's a side of we need that just even context of who your congregation is. It needs to come like I feel like God gives His people the word for His their to for the word for their people to shepherd, and so I feel like it's that sermon. Uh, but that said, I think it's going to create maybe 90% efficiency in your sermon preparation, uh, just like Google brought efficiency in your sermon pres- preparation okay. the internet from a date or information access. At the risk of derailing this whole episode and making this about this one issue, I'm going <laughs> to posit this one question, right? Okay. Because what, what if, and we know that, say you have an average preacher catching yep. a sermon, uh, we know the SBC denomination last year put out a report that i believe almost 50 percent of the churches did not baptize a single person this past calendar year 50 huh. percent, something like it was uh it's under 50 percent, but huh. it's it's double digits yeah um you can ask chat to chat yes we could, we could ask or ask perplexity to okay, chat time, right? Okay, right um there's a significant number of yeah we know we have the capabilities of ai in in ability to generate persuasive, logical, theological threaded works. Yes. That whether it's today in 2024 or a year from now, five years from now, at some point, yes. I'm going to be able to generate a manuscript for a sermon that is more, quotes, productive, right? Yes. On that measure alone. So yeah. if we're using that metric as yeah. success of how many people do you bring to Christ that yes. are going to get right. baptized? Yes. We know... I think you can bet on the fact that AI at some point will be able to generate sermons that are more productive on that one measure alone. Yes. On a regular basis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How can you argue? How can you argue against 
we'd rather have less baptisms, less, less people come to Christ and not use artificial intelligence to generate those sermons. Your podcast may get blown up. Yeah. After this. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I feel like that the human element is probably more so empathy than anything else. Mm. I'm a, as a pastor, you have empathy with Let, your congregation. I'm just going to cut you off there. Let's go back to those <laughs> metrics. Okay. So you're saying that empathy will cover the fact that you're not as productive on bringing people to Christ than the AI-generated survey. And it, ChatGPT just came out with a new model that introduced reasoning, right? Yeah. That, yeah. When it generates empathy, yes. when you actually have AI in everyone's phones and understanding personal AIs, right? Yeah. Where you have all that connected together. We have some oh. of... We have some of the projects here trying to. This feels like a false them. dichotomy. <laughs> this, is, this is a false dichotomy. You're, you're antagonistic. Here's why I think this is a false dichotomy okay. because uh, you gave a good example earlier. When I when I preach, I consult prior to ChatGPT being a thing. Yes. Uh, Google. Yes. I do my research in my bookshelf yep. behind me, yep. but I also supplement it with lots of Google yes. stuff. Does that mean that I somehow remove the empathy or that somehow it's no longer? It doesn't have the integrity of, of me preaching that sermon. I would argue that any preacher, maybe not all, but but any preacher should be free to consult GBT to uh, maybe supercharge, to, yeah. to do yeah. some of the research, to inform. Yeah. But the heart, the empathy should also be a part of it. Well, but what Preaching think, yeah. is an embodied, is an embodied experience. Yes. Yeah. And that incarnational moment yeah. is really important. And I think that's what you're getting at. Oh, yeah. 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 I don't want there to be a, a false dichotomy. Well, that is it really a false dichotomy? Because you're talking about, okay, a local pastor knows their congregation. Yes. The average American church right now, I think, uh, at least in one major denomination, yes. attendance is down to 60-something people. I get that. But what about Billy Graham in a stadium um, where you have mega pastors? They mm -hmm. do not know how to empathize with all those seats in row in section CC, yeah. so the bureau was, you know, 12. Sure. You know, and at that point, you have an AI that can yeah. actually bring that person to Christ. Good. Well, what? I, I don't know what the answer is, well, but I feel well, like I think, that's a question yeah. we need to think through yeah. now. Well, 100%. there is. That's, because there's two, there's two different dimensions to this. One, a very spiritual one, one, a very human one. Okay. The spiritual one being that the, in that moment of sermon creation preparation, you mentioned the word preparation, Jason, which I think makes a lot of sense, is that there's a difference between preparing something, preparing even a really great prompt and giving that to ChatGPT and then saying, polish this up and write this, that's right. rather than saying, write me a sermon on that's 1 Corinthians right. 13. Absolutely. And what comes out the other end of the sermon of 1 Corinthians 13, I'm not saying that God can't use ChatGPT to do that so because he can use he can, things. Of course. <laughs> but then this comes the human element, which is the thing I worry about is that when we start saying we can give over the entire act of doing that to mm -hmm. an AI, yeah. it breeds in us our base senses which is basically laziness yeah right and so do we want to default over to bad habits of becoming lazy yeah. and using so, AI yeah. to do that so there's a balance to be found at least like, yeah like it's one or, or the other but it's that, that we have to you know thoughtfully and prayerfully you know, kind of approach the throwing and say yeah, yeah am i now and i think i think you're bringing the holy spirit into this yeah. yes you know and I think sure. end of the day. Sure. I, i'm with you i i do think though at the risk of you know, flooding my inbox with hate mail. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, KennyMattChurchTechToday.com <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to have to change yeah, my entire email. Email. Um, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's removing the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Like, if, if you, again, this is not where I'm saying we should default to going first, but at some point in the future where we're reaching AGI, yeah. where the intelligence of the machine is greater than us, yeah. the mental capacity, the faculty, the empathy, everything is, mm -hmm. the reasoning is greater than our own capabilities. Yeah. Yeah. Should we relook at the role of what the pastor is, the office mm -hmm. of the pastor, and if you can free up 15, I don't know how much the average pastor, I wonder what the research is. Is it 10 hours, hours 15 yeah, hours, yeah, sometimes 20 yeah, hours? Yeah. Saturday night, you're still in 22, right. 20, you're pushing right. hours. Right. Um, could you free up more than that? 80% of that time, oh, yeah. could you spend, like, what is the value of 18 one hour coffees a week, 52 weeks a year with your people versus being in your study 
and building a manager's well but isn't that like breaking down actually like what we're asking pastors to do though in the moment that's what i'm saying it's the office of the pastor the role of the pastor expectations but, but we do we we do see right that paul kind of says like yeah we are given the you know, first teachers and pastors and helpers and guides and so teaching is a specific kind of gifting ministry and calling a part of you know that specific thing out and teaching separate outside of the role of pastoring and what you're saying and that is kind of 18 coffees that week so i think what we have to like really think through is there's a difference when you sit there and go i'm picking what passage we're going to write about or the topic we're going to read about or we're going to dig into this versus just saying write me a sermon i think if there's a, literally a button on a website somewhere that says write me a sermon click a button and here's my sermon for the week then we have to ask like okay well then are you really called to be a teacher because that's not teaching that's delivery sure and so we, what i think that's what we're asking is like you know, will we see people be more efficient in their teaching sure but we don't want people just to become like you know domino's delivery boys actors but i just i i after. just wonder where is it just that I mean, I, maybe this is a whole other podcast series yeah. that we need to have mm -hmm. yeah. but i just have this question that maybe we need to rethink that role and that says even in that uh congregation of 60 people yeah if you had 18 extra hours to meet with yeah. people 52 weeks a year mm -hmm. wouldn't you be able to employ more empathy how many times will you have a, a coffee with any given person in your 60 person congregation 100 person congregation this right. year yes could you do more damage for the good of the gospel mm -hmm. then right then damage well i was the wrong choice of this. <laughs> i'm working against myself right now yeah. here for the good for the right? good, for the good. Yeah, for right, the good. Can, right can you can you make a bigger dent yeah in yeah. meeting with people five more times a year 10 more times a year and really get to know them pray mm -hmm. with them and look at the office of the pastor differently anyway that's just i'll just leave it there and, and I'll, I'll button it up uh, yeah if you've ever read uh the reformed pastor richard baxter tells the story of the parish pastor in kidderminster england yes who models it's a great place. house to house <laughs> kidderminster house to house parishional yeah. pastoral work where yeah. over the course of an entire year richard baxter said the pastor is supposed to meet with their congregants in their kitchen and pastor them. Yes. Uh, so now nah, there's a debate. Yes. Obviously. So you totally agree with me, Jason. <laughs> I understand that. Well, well but, but you say that, but I, I think I, I don't want to open up. A different, well, you, you asked, like, what are the different issues? We talked about sermon generation. But the other thing we're seeing in there, you, know, you use the example of the, the um, bot that's looking at kind of suicide prevention and mental health. Because we are also seeing people trying to hand off some of the pastoring jobs. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, now, that to me, I think, is equally interesting and opportunity is huge right as ch if in certain contexts where churches are more than 60 or 80 people yes how do you get around i love that, that. Well? Yeah. i love that so there's there is an interesting issue to come dive into there because you know, with these you mentioned the the for those that are tracking with this like the new models that have come out this week as we're recording chat gpt have re released what's known as more reasoning, reasoning. based models yes. yeah now the problem with a reasoning based model is it's no longer just predicting the next word in a sentence it has its own logic framework within it that it's working on if we're going to build some of these solutions on top of that, we have to be asking what is the ethical yes. reasoning that's going on underneath. You can't just and assume that it's precise. Well, and I'm not sure we know. We don't know. No, we don't I know. think the future of things like Calm no. uh, is exciting to me because as we begin to see those models go from just being language models to reasoning models, we can actually maybe see a, a version where we be can begin to align a reasoning AI mm -hmm. around certain Christian ethics. Mm -hmm. And then you maybe can unlock some of those more pastoral conversations. Yes. Mm -hmm. As long as they're human guidance, mm -hmm. right? Like as long as the human's in the loop within right. those situations, right. I think yeah. we can begin to maybe scale the role of the pastor. So we can then begin to rethink this balance between hello, hello. there may be 18 hours saved from sermon preparation, but it doesn't necessarily mean those 18 hours have to go straight back into a bunch of coffees just for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. so, well, I'm going to ask you guys to hold that thought. We're, I want to talk about the suicide. There's multiple projects we're yeah. talking about suicide and intervention of AI. Um, but we're here at the end of our time for the podcast. We're going to tease a part two of this conversation. So I want you to hang on. Um, do me a favor. Drop a comment below. You don't need to email me personally. Drop a <laughs> comment here below with your thoughts on the knockdown drag out fight that might happen here. Would you like to go us a little deeper on that initial um, question about AI and sermonizing? Uh, but in this next episode right after this, we'll be talking about more boundaries of suicide, pastoral care, and other things like that. And we'll catch you here in the next episode of the podcast. Mm -hmm.